Good morning. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Advent. Uh, I find that as the season uh, approaches Christmas, life tends to get uh, a bit more hectic, a bit busier, our schedules become fuller. Uh, a, a common practice in prayer is to hold your hands in front of you and imagine with your hands open the things that you are carrying, uh, the, the schedule, the burdens, the tasks to be done. Um, but then I invite you, if you would, to, to just turn them over. Uh, and just for the next hour, if you just lay those things down and allow yourself to be here, to be fully present and to be fully present to the presence of God among us. Let us prepare ourselves to be with God, to meet with God in this time. Let us worship.
Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you. I invite you to stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. Hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. In God's time of joy, all sorrow and sighing will leave us. As we wait for God's time, in faith we light the candles of Please join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed number 881 in your hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. 
he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Good morning. All right. It's good to be here in worship with all of those that are here in the sanctuary as well as those who are joining with us online. Hopefully you received a bulletin on your way into worship today. I do invite you to take a look in the bulletin and to mark your calendars to join us for upcoming events uh, between now and the end of the year. On the side of your bulletin is a connect card. This is, a way, this is a way for us to follow up and to connect with those who've joined us in worship. If you have prayer requests you would like to share with the pastors and our prayer team, uh, please write those on the card. If you have other questions or need anything from the church, you can write it on the card and return it in the offering plate when it comes your way later in the service. If this is your first time with us in worship or one of your early times with us in worship, we're so glad that you're here. We invite you to take your Connect card, hold on to it, and uh, go to our welcome desk immediately after this service. Someone will be there to greet you, to give you a gift, and to answer any questions that you have about First Church. I do want to share a few announcements. Savannah has reminded me that we still have pecans for sale. Now, my family in South Georgia would say pecans. So depending on where you're from, you pronounce it differently. Uh, but we still have some of those available. Immediately after the service, you can stop by the front desk or we're at this little table near the front desk and get the pecans uh, for your holiday baking or for gifts uh, that you still have to shop for. Uh, all of the proceeds from the pecan sale go to our youth group and help support their youth ministry efforts in the summertime. Tonight at 7 o'clock, streaming on the church Facebook page, we are offering our Hope for Christmas service. This is a service that Stephen ministers and other care ministers have put together to offer hope and healing to those who may be struggling during the Advent and Christmas season. This is an opportunity to reflect and to pray, and so we invite you to join us online tonight at 7. This is also the type of service where you may know someone who is struggling, and this is a great opportunity to maybe share the link, um, maybe say, hey, watch this service with me, or send it to them after the fact um, as a way to just offer them hope and peace in this time. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary, we have our Christmas concert. So you just heard our bells and our choir and Linda on the organ. Somehow, it's amazing how they can play together, isn't it? It's, it's incredible to me every time when they do a piece like that. And so tomorrow night, there's more, right? So this was just a preview. This was just a taste an appetizer, if you will, of what they will be offering and sharing with us tomorrow night. We hope you'll join us and uh, prepare your hearts and spirits for the Christmas season. Today we have been collecting food, canned food, non-perishable food items for Feed the Need, and those food items will be boxed up tonight at Youth Group and sent out into the community to support a local food pantry. Thank you for your support. If you forgot your food items, uh, you might want to run to the store, and if you bring them back here tonight before Youth Group, they will get packed up and sent out into um, our community uh, later this week. And then this coming Saturday at Weingard Elementary School, we will be working and serving to pass out food from Second Harvest to families in our community. This is an annual tradition here at First Church uh, to give away like thousands of pounds of food to hundreds of families in our community. So if you haven't yet signed up, the signups are online and we would love to see you there next Saturday. Then finally, I don't know if you all know this, but Christmas Eve is December 24th. It's coming. We have two services for you this uh, Christmas Eve. The first one is at 5 o'clock. The second one is at 7.30. And both are here in our beautiful sanctuary. So we invite you to attend. Perhaps you want to invite a family member or a friend to join with you. We still have opportunities to serve as an usher or greeter. And if you would like to do so, please contact the church office. If you know you'll be available that evening, we would love to, to see your smiling face helping direct those um, coming to worship here on Christmas Eve. I believe that concludes my announcements uh, today. As we enter into a time of prayer, I do want to lift up all of those who've been affected by the tornadoes in the Midwest. Um, as part of the United Methodist Church, we are a connectional church, it means that we serve together throughout the nation and the world. And so our United Methodist Committee on Relief will be offering support and assistance to those that have been affected by the tornadoes. 
If some of you support financially the work of UMCOR and these various uh, responses to natural disasters, and so we will have more information um, about how you might support uh, that ministry and that relief effort in the days to come. But in the meantime, we can hold the people and those communities affected in prayer. Let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, you are good. You spoke creation into existence and called it good. You created human beings in your image and called them very good. Generations later, you are still creating human beings, us, in your image and breathing into us your very breath of life. And you are still calling us good. You love us. You delight in us. Nothing we do or say or achieve will cause you to love us more than you already do. And nothing we do or say or fail to do will cause you to love us less. You love us unconditionally. In Zephaniah chapter 3, we read these words. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior bringing victory. He will create calm with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. You indeed are in our midst today, God. You work for good in your creation. You restore and make whole all that is broken. You create peace, shalom, with your love. You rejoice over us with singing. God, we bring before you all that is broken and messed up in our lives and in the world. We bring before you relationships that are strained. We bring before you our disappointments and our regrets. We remember before you all those in our community who hunger who do not have enough food to eat. We give thanks that you are at work in the midst of all of these situations, mending that which is broken, giving hope, restoring peace. You are at work in the lives of people, people like us here today, people who are imperfect, and yet you work with us, you use us, you use our voices and our bodies to be your hands and feet in this world. We give thanks for using us to bring food, to gather food, to collect food for those who are hungry in our communities. We give thanks that you use us to serve food next Saturday at Weingard Elementary School. We pray for these hunger relief efforts. We pray that you pour out your spirit of blessing upon all the food that will be given out and distributed. Multiply that food. Bless the families who will receive it. Nourish their bodies and their minds and their souls. Satisfy physical hunger, and somehow may these gifts of food point others to you, to the 
to the source of life, to the source of goodness, to the one who can alleviate our spiritual hunger. Today we remember all those who've been affected by the tornadoes in the Midwest. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones and have not heard from loved ones. Comfort your people. Work through people to bring hope and healing. Relief and restoration to those who are in need. It's in times of tragedy like this that we remember that you are God, Emmanuel, God with us. That you come to be with us in the midst of life's joys and celebration and in the midst of life's tragedies and heartbreaks. You are with us through it all. You are faithful towards us and with us. You delight over us with singing. Give us ears to hear your voice of love. Enable us to join in singing your words of blessing and grace. May we be your echo in this world. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son, in whom you are well pleased. And we pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Jonathan and Elizabeth Earls to come forward with their son, James, for baptism today. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift to us, offered to us without price. Jonathan and Elizabeth, there are questions we ask of the parents. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? The answer is I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil and justice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? We nurture James in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself to profess his faith openly and to lead a Christian life. The answer is I will. I will. All right. Okay. okay. Hey, buddy. Okay. Hi. Let's just take this hat down just a little bit. Okay. James Edward, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May God's spirit work within you, that you may ever become a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Hi. Members of the household of God, I commend to your love and care James Edward, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that James may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ? And the congregation responds. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that James, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith 
and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. And we have a song that we'll be singing. Some baptisms during the time of COVID, but James is like the first one that hasn't like screamed <laughs> and hasn't like been afraid to come to a pastor. So this is lovely. This is so wonderful. Thank you. That's okay. No worries. Here we go. Today is also a special day in that uh, James's mother Elizabeth will be transferring her membership from University of Carillon to here at First United Methodist Church of Orlando. And so we have a question that we would like to ask of Elizabeth. Elizabeth, will you faithfully pledge to support the congregation here at First United Methodist Church of Orlando by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And if so, answer with, I will. I will. We welcome both James and Elizabeth and Jonathan to our First Church family. At this time, we invite the ushers to come and wait on us this morning as we present to God our tithes and our offerings.
gracious God, we give thanks for all the gifts that you've given to us. We thank you for these tithes and offerings given back to you. Receive them, bless them, and use them for your glory in the world. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time we invite you to join with us in singing our hymn of preparation. Will you please join me in the prayer for illumination? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this day. Amen. Today's scripture is from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah chapter 12. You will say on that day, I thank you, Lord. Though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. God is indeed my salvation. I will trust and won't be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my shield. He has become my salvation. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation, and you will say on that day, Thank the Lord.
Call on God's name. Proclaim God's deeds among the peoples. Declare that God's name is exalted. Sing to the Lord who has done glorious things. Proclaim this throughout all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, city of Zion, because the Holy One of Israel is great among you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As I'm sure you're aware, the traditional color of Advent is purple. That's right. But on this particular day, the third Sunday of Advent, the color shifts just for one day, and we light a pink candle. Technically, for the liturgical purists among us, the color isn't pink, it's rose, so just remember that for trivial, uh, for uh, next time you play Trivial Pursuit or something. There's also a special name for this particular day. Sometimes it's referred to as Rose Sunday, or often it's also called Gaudet Sunday. Gaudet is the Latin word for Rejoice, And in the old Catholic Latin Mass, the first words that the priest would say to the congregation was Gaudet in Domino Semper. Gaudet in Domino Semper. Rejoice in God forever. Rejoice. That's the theme of this Sunday. That's the, the mood of this Sunday. Rejoice. As in rejoice. Rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. The purpose of Rose Sunday or Gaudet Sunday is to infuse in the midst of what can be a fairly dark season, a, a bit of lightness, a bit of light. Even though we anticipate Christmas coming and the celebration of light coming into the world, Advent is more a season of darkness, a time of preparation. And so this third Sunday, this Rose Sunday, is an opportunity just to take a little bit of a breath from the heaviness to anticipate the joy that is to come. That's the word for the day, really, joy. Joy for the birth that we will celebrate, a deeper joy for acknowledging God's divine action in sending His Son, a joy that's possible even in the midst of darkness. Howard Thurman once wrote, Christmas returns as it always does with its assurance that life is good. How life is good, why life is good depends very much on how we understand joy. Joy is a word that we often use interchangeably with happiness. Sometimes we say we're happy, sometimes we say we're joyful, and oftentimes we mean basically the same thing. But there is a distinction. Happiness is that reaction. It is that emotive response. It is the feeling we get when in a moment, a certain situation, a purpose, a thing makes us feel good. It gives us pleasure. It makes us happy. Happiness is dependent upon any given moment or situation and the degree to which I like it, the degree to which I find it favorable. And this time of year, there's a lot to make us happy, isn't there? As the song goes, it's the hap happiest time of the year. We have parties to make us happy. We give and receive gifts that make us happy. When you see a child's face on Christmas morning, you can't help but be happy. Being with friends and family is a source of happiness. Good food, good drink, good music, decking the halls. What could be happier? In fact, at Christmas, your happiness is, is virtually guaranteed. If you don't like shopping, well, just pull out your phone and order all of your Christmas gifts online, and they will likely arrive the next day or maybe even sooner. If you don't like the Christmas song you're listening to, well, subscribe to Spotify and pick the song you want. 
If you want to watch your favorite Christmas movie, you can do it. They're streaming constantly. Just just pick the one you want and download it. Or if you're desperate, go to the Hallmark Channel. There's Christmas 24 hours a day. If you don't feel like cooking, order from your favorite restaurant and Uber Eats will bring it to you. I even saw a commercial this week that if you are decorating your house and you run out of lights, you can call Walgreens and they will deliver decorations right to your door. You don't have to go to all the trouble of getting in your car and driving all the way to the nearest Walgreens. What a hassle. And if you don't get what you want for Christmas, that thing that you knew would make you happy, it'll be half off the day after Christmas. You just buy it for yourself. How can we not be endlessly happy this time of year? And by the way, we live down the street from Disney World, which says it's the happiest place on earth. And thousands upon thousands of people come here every year just to be happy. How could we not be so hap, hap, happy this time of year? As I was preparing for today, I also discovered something I didn't know, that there are an abundance of companies, restaurants, real real, uh, retailers that offer what they call a 100% happiness guarantee. This is a real thing and is offered by many. If you are not 100% satisfied with the service you've received, the meal you've received, the product that was sent, they guarantee they will refund you or replace the product that makes you unhappy. But I'm thinking, how can you be 100% happy if you've already had to call customer service to let them know you're unhappy? But just think about it, 100% happy, guaranteed 100% happy, wouldn't that be wonderful? There's a lot of days I'd settle for 80% happy. (laughs) There are moments I would settle for 75% happy. There are days I would go for 50-50. 100% happiness, guaranteed, how wonderful. No more sickness, no more disappointment, no more sadness, no more waiting in line. If you ever have a bad day at work or an argument with your spouse, even if she's right and you're wrong, if you ever get stuck in traffic on I-4, if your favorite team ever loses, even if the other team was really better anyway, if you get that letter from the IRS, if you ever get bad news from the doctor, just call customer service and you get a full refund for that particular day. Wouldn't that be something? But life isn't like that, is it? I mean, there are moments that we're ecstatically happy. There are days that are filled with happiness, even seasons. But there are also days, moments, occasions, seasons that we aren't as happy. And as much as I think God delights in our happiness, as much as I believe God enjoys our happiness, is happy when we're happy, God never guaranteed 100% happiness in this life. You and I both know so well that life has ups and downs, peaks and valleys, highs and lows, happy and unhappy days. Just imagine when you married your spouse, if the pastor had asked if you would commit to make your spouse 100% happy for the rest of their life. How many of us would have been successful at that? Instead, what most of us vow at our weddings is to love, honor, and cherish for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, acknowledging that there will be much happiness, but there will be unhappiness as well. Let let me tell you about happiness. Can I tell you about happiness for a moment? Happiness was this week when I discovered that Helen Kirst had made me a homemade coffee cake. And I have been happy every day eating it. Now it says on the note that it's for the Reigns family, but I know what she meant. (laughs) And I'm enjoying as much of it as I can get away with. But here's the problem. With each bite, sorrow approaches. My happiness will soon be ending. Soon, I mean, soon. When that coffee cake is gone. 
sad days are in my near future. (laughs) There is a difference between joy and happiness. And that doesn't mean happiness is a bad thing. Happiness is a wonderful thing. Both happy and joyful people laugh. Both happy and joyful people smile. Both happy and joyful people have fun and enjoy life. But happiness is dependent upon circumstance. Have you ever noticed how happy you can be one moment and unhappy the next? Certain foods make me happy, others not so much. Certain people make me happy, others... mm. There are certain conversations I enjoy and others I'd prefer to avoid. There are aspects of my job that I find delightful and other parts, mm, you know. (laughs) Happiness, happiness depends on circumstances aligning with our particular desires, preferences, needs, and those vary from moment to moment. Joy is something else. Joy is deeper. Joy is something that can persist regardless of circumstances. Any given moment, I might be happy or unhappy, but I can be persistently joyful because joy is rooted in something much deeper. It's rooted in the belief, the promise that life is indeed good. Life is fundamentally, essentially, dependently, persistently good because God is good. A particular moment might not be so good. A season of my life might not be so good. A particular outcome might not be so good. But life is persistently good because God is good and God is real and God is present and God is always at work. There's a tradition in the African-American church. The pastor will say to the congregation, God is good. Well, you know it, but you weren't enthusiastic about it. God is good. And all the time. That is the root and the source of true spiritual joy. Julian of Norwich is famous for saying, all will be well. No matter what's going on around you, all will be well. And all will be well, and all manners of things will be well. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with happiness. I like to be happy as much as anybody else. I think God believes in our happiness, longs for our happiness, but happiness comes to go. And so God offers, in addition to our happiness, joy. It's not the spiritual substitute for joy. For happiness, we can be both. Experience happiness as it comes your way, but seek joy. Richard Rohr wrote, God, Christian maturity is the ability to live joyfully in an imperfect world. Let me read that again. Christian maturity is the ability to live joyfully in an imperfect world. I've been in ministry of one form or another for for 30 plus years. One of the things that still surprises me is that often when I go to visit with a family in the hospital or in their home, shortly after a loved one has died, how often there is laughter. Yes, there are tears, and yes, there, there's sadness, but so often when you gather with a family after someone has died, someone starts telling stories, and soon everyone is laughing, that there can be joy even in the midst of grief. Or I was thinking about a visit I made to a retired pastor who I had served with early in my ministry. I had heard that he was dying of cancer and that he was near the end. And so I went and visited with him on a Thursday night. We shared memories with each other and we talked about our call to ministry and we laughed. And he even said, you know, I might beat this cancer thing. I might just live. I think I've got some more sermons I want to preach. And I said, what, what do you want to preach on? He said, I think I've learned some things about death and dying that people ought to hear. The next day he was in a coma. The next day he was dead. But for a couple hours we had joy. In one of my former churches, on my very first day at the church, I went to the hospital to visit an older member named Delcia. Delcia had cancer. She too was dying and knew it. In fact, she was 
had cancer and was dying the entire time I knew her. Frequently when I would visit, I'd say, Delcia, how you doing? And she always responded the exact same way. She quoted the old hymn, trust and obey. She'd say, trust and obey, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Trust and obey. And what other options has he given me? And she laughed. And she became my teacher, teaching me what it meant to die with faith. Just one other story. Many, many years ago in the 90s, I was serving a church, and a member of our church who was one of our pillars discovered he too had cancer. And the doctor said that there was no treatment available for his type of cancer, and he likely had less than a year to live. Rather than letting that defeat him, he got busy. He finished some some details of the family business to get their affairs in order. He even completed a few tasks at church for us. He walked his daughter down the aisle at her wedding. He attended his son's graduation from law school. He and his wife played bridge, and they achieved some high-level achievement during that time. And I went to visit him the day before he died, which you would expect to be a, a somber, sad moment I opened the door to his hospital room. He sat up in his bed, reached out to me, and gave me a big smile and spent the entire visit telling me how much I had meant to him and how much he believed in my ministry. And when I prayed with him and said goodbye, I knew I'd never see him in this life again. And yet that visit was so full of joy. Joy can exist in a hospital room. Joy can exist in the heart of someone dying of cancer. Joy can exist even in the midst of grief. It's possible to be joyful even when we're profoundly sad. In fact, I've heard one of the the clearest, surest signs of someone's relationship with God and their spiritual maturity is their ability to be joyful no matter what. Of course, we also know it's possible to be deeply religious without any joy in your heart at all. St. Teresa of Avila once said, from somber devotions and sour-faced saints, good Lord, deliver us. <laughs> Amen to that. Joy, the source of joy, is rooted in the conviction that life is indeed good because God is good all the time. Earlier, I read to us from Isaiah chapter 12, which occurs fairly early in the book of Isaiah. In fact, the readings from the last two weeks have also come from this first part of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah warned the people, along with the other prophets, that doom was inevitable. They had neglected God's ways, and enemies had gathered at their borders, and soon Israel would be destroyed. The people of God would be taken away to foreign lands as slaves. And yet, even as they faced inevitable hardship, there was encouragement. God will be with you. God will be faithful. God will work. And it's in the midst of this context that hope for a Messiah was born. I was particularly struck by verse 3 of Isaiah 12. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation. That's a metaphor, of course, and a deeply meaningful metaphor in the Middle East and biblical times, an arid climate, a desert-like place. You can imagine the importance of a well or spring on a farm or in a village or on a road as someone traveled. Water, finding a well, could be salvation. And that word is significant. You will draw water with joy from the spring of salvation. So often we think of salvation so narrowly, ultimately about where I go when I die. But biblically, the word salvation is much deeper and much more rich. It's more holistic. It's more close to rescue or healing. When there is something broken in my life, God wants salvation for me. If my relationship with God is broken, if my relationship with people are broken, if my family is broken, my community is broken, God desires salvation, healing, fixing, 
rescuing. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation. Joy comes from knowing that God cares so deeply about my well-being, my wholeness, my family, all things in my life. Even in bad times, it's trust that God is God and God is working. Father James Martin writes, the secular mind sees joy and is an intense form of happiness or delight. The religious mind sees joy as intimately connected to belief in God. Grounded in the faith, even in tough times, and nourished by the relationship with the divine, joy is happiness in God. And for people of faith, especially during this season, the clearest expression of God's goodness and faithfulness is the incarnation, the birth, the life, the teaching, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ Isaiah 12, 6 says, Shout and sing for joy, city of Zion, because the Holy One of Israel is great among you. The Holy One of Israel is great among you. Isn't that what we say about this Jesus, that we will call him Emmanuel, God with us? Isn't that what the angels told the shepherds? I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. And isn't it what we sing this time of year? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Joy to the, lo- wor- joy to the world, the Lord has come. There is joy and happiness in his birth. But even more importantly, There's joy in knowing what he came to do and what he accomplished. As we also sing this time of year, no more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. So what's stealing your joy? What's robbing you of your joy? Maybe it's happiness. Maybe it's the pursuit of happiness that sometimes fails you. Maybe it's a need for a deeper joy of knowing who God is and who God wants to be in your life. Sometimes we theologically use words like sin and sorrow and curse to explain the human condition, to explain why there's suffering. But joy knows that God has acted, that the king has come, that the curse has been broken, and that God's love has been proven. No matter what you're enduring these days, no matter what's robbing you of your happiness or joy, draw with water from the springs of salvation. It's available to you and it will never run out. Draw water with joy from the spring of God's salvation. Let us pray. And so, Lord, we pray for those among us who are struggling to find joy in this season. Remind them of your presence in their life, O oh God. Remind them of your faithfulness. Remind us all of your goodness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is in the bleak midwinter, number 221. Will you stand and let us sing together?
was beautiful. Will you join me in our benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.